This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. As someone who is super into cameras and photography and videography and watches a lot of content creators in those fields, a topic that comes up time and time again that I always find a little interesting is the discussion about sensor size. Now the camera sensor of course being the little actual chip inside your camera body that takes in the light and there's circuit boards behind it that translate it into the digital video feed that you see. You know, the digital replacement for the actual three and a half millimeter film that was typically in film cameras. And there are a couple different, well actually, theoretically there's unlimited different sensor sizes because there's even camera sensors in your smartphones which are super tiny and the same with webcams and things like that. But for standard normal camera body based photo and video production, there's usually about three-ish kinds that are more common or popular these days, which is the APS-C, which is your standard Sony cameras or a lot of the Canon DSLRs, such as the T3i, T6i, those kinds of cameras. There is Micro Four Thirds, which is common in the Panasonic cameras here. I have the G85, the G7, the GH4, the GH5. GH5S is still technically a Micro Four Thirds camera, but it's a little bit bigger. And then there is full frame cameras, which represent the entire 35 millimeter framing, you know, availability that is possible, which is what's present here in my Canon 6D Mark II. This is a full frame camera. And what this means is that you basically have different literally sizes of sensors, but lenses are all typically made for one or two sensor sizes. And so that means that with each sensor, you actually get a different field of view or a different crop as they're referred to into the frame for your shot. But there's always a little bit of a perspective issue I have when popular photography or videography YouTubers cover this subject because the question that arises is which sensor size should I pick? I have a few different cameras here that I've used. The G85, I have a bunch of G7s. This is the Sony A5100, that's APS-C. I've got my San Canon 6D Mark II, that's full frame. And then my primary camera that I'm shooting on is my Ursa Mini Pro, which is Super 35, which is akin to APS-C, but it's a little different. Question comes up, which one should I use? And pretty much every single one of those videos ends up answering that question with whichever one you want. You can shoot with whatever you want. You can get shots with anything. You can make photography with anything. That's not wrong. That's not factually incorrect by any stretch of the imagination. But where I feel like there's a weird perspective disconnect is when I'm watching those videos, when I'm a, you know, 2016 really getting into camera production YouTuber where I'm transitioning away from mostly screen capture stuff and I'm trying to learn about camera stuff and I'm getting into some issues where the camera I'm using isn't producing the same results as the courses that I'm watching or the videos I'm watching despite being at similar settings as far as I'm aware, I want to know how much does sensor size matter? How much, you know, which one should I be going with when I'm buying a new camera? And when I see a YouTuber who pulls up kind of like I'm doing here, although these are far fewer examples, but pulls out a bunch of different bodies and then has an entire arsenal of tens of thousands of dollars of lenses to basically showcase and just be like, yeah, if you want the shot from the full frame, you just gotta get this other lens over here and put it on the micro four thirds and you got the same shot for the most part, you can do it. And I'm like, all right. And then I realize I don't have thousands of dollars to spend on glass after I've already bought an expensive camera body as much as lenses may be a more important investment for your camera purchase. I'm left confused how I'm supposed to do this if I don't have access to buy every lens or the most expensive Canon L lenses or things like that. And I feel like there's a massive disconnect here and I've got a lot of notes here on my phone and this video is going to be featuring a, cu a, a couple of clips from my buddy Gerald Undone who is going to help answer some of the more technical stuff behind this because this is a topic I really want to talk about and this video is going to be pretty long because this intro was already stupidly long so buckle in, we're doing this. So for clarification and for context, I completely agree that for the most part, you can do any style of photography or videography on any video sensor or sensor size or camera and you know, the whole gear doesn't matter thing. I feel like gear does matter, but from a workflow perspective, not from a quality perspective. And that's where all of those arguments make me mad because 
in my work with the stuff that I do, gear does matter. But that's with regards to workflow and where you're working. You see, for context, all of the content that I have made, all of the stuff that I have made to date has been in small spaces. I've been working from bedrooms in my apartments that I live in. At first, when I was doing this, I was doing it from the bedroom that I slept in and lived in in my parents' home. And now I have a studio, which is just a small bedroom in my apartment. I have a living room in my apartment, but it doesn't have enough room for me to actually put a bunch of extra tables down there for shooting spaces. So I have small spaces where the camera needs to be up close to the subject that I'm recording, and I don't have a whole lot of distance between my subject and my intended background where I expect, you know, the depth of field to fall off. So then when I'm trying to shoot things with a two times crop camera that's micro four thirds after I upgraded to the Panasonic G7 system and I'm not able to get much depth of field because I don't have, you know, an, a, a mile of space for the distance to fall off and I actually blur out in your shot, I'm left really confused how I'm supposed to make this stuff work. And to a degree, I can't. And even, you know, as I'm learning shots and seeing other people who make shots and trying to ask how they make them, I have a photographer buddy, Eric Naso, who does a lot of cool stuff. Sometimes he'll post a nice little B-roll shot from his product video and he's got the camera right up on the product and then some lights behind it. And there's like maybe four or five total feet of space being worked here with, with the camera. And it's got a nice blurred out depth of field with all them bokeh balls. And I'm like, how the hell do you do that? I can't do that. And I already understand lenses and cameras and stuff for the most part. And it's just like, yeah, I just got a 50 millimeter F blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, oh, well, I'm on micro four thirds. I'd need like a hundred feet to make that work. And he's like, yeah, you need a lot of distance or a fast as hell, like 35 millimeter. And that's where the problem comes in is the math of that. That is where for me, the crop factor, the practicality of the crop factor comes into play. I have been using primarily micro four thirds cameras until I picked up my Ursa Mini Pro. And you can see how tiny that sensor is. It is super teeny tiny. It is minuscule. Now, typically, whenever these videos address this, and granted, the one that I'm going to reference from Tony Northrup does a little bit of a better job trying not to drop cameras here, it still runs into the wall of lenses that don't exist. Now, from purely a focal length perspective, this is where a lot of videos fall short because at this point in the discussion, that doesn't matter too much. You can up to a wall, of course. You can always keep buying wider lenses and find a way to make it work. No problem. I have done that. Most of my G7 shooting pretty much has been exclusively on a 12 millimeter F2 lens because that's the widest lens, you know, the widest lens I could get without distortion that has a decent aperture that allows me to self-focus without having to reach far away like I am right now. I had to have my wife come focus for me and hopefully we used autofocus. Hopefully it's okay. I can tell my shirt is completely in focus, but I get no information about my eyes. Self-shooting problems. The problem comes in when you're actually trying to control your shot for light intake because the crop factor not only applies to your focal length, it applies to your aperture. And most people completely don't acknowledge this factor, don't even know it. So that means that a F2 lens that would be F2 on a full frame and get you beautiful wide, you know, blown out background and nice bokeh and decent lighting on your subject, which isn't super effective the actual depth of field aspect of that aperture is also multiplied here. So instead of F2, I'm getting F4, which means the background, the foreground separation, which isn't all about bokeh balls, but is about, you know, removing distracting elements from your webcam and things like that is then multiplied and you're no longer getting that same depth of field. To illustrate this, I had a little bit of fun. My typical webcam setup for my desktop tutorials is the Panasonic G7 with a 12 millimeter F2 lens. Sits there, stays there works pretty good for me, but sometimes the background can still be distracting. It is our living room. So there's usually laundry on the couch and things like that. And I don't always have the ability to mitigate that before making a video. I compensate for that by keeping it super dark so you can barely see anything in the background, but it would be nice if it was just blurred out in a more pleasing way. So while it's too heavy for the mount that I have the G7 on, I simply set my Canon 60 Mark II, which is full frame on my monitor next to where my G7 is and pointed it at me. So this is full frame and this is only at F3.5. If I had an actual F2 lens that was this wide, it would be even better. And you can see there's a fairly significant difference in the depth of field and the background separation. Now it's, it's smaller than it should be because we're actually only getting, you know, half a stop there F4 or F3.5 to F4. We're not getting a whole lot of light, you know, to depth of field difference there. 
but you can see where it would continue to scale, which honestly has me considering trying to scrounge for a super cheap used Sony A7S II on eBay once the A7S III comes out and those start hitting eBay to be able to do this kind of thing and replace my G7 for a less distracting but more pleasing looking background. I realize that a lot of people feel there's too much obsession with Pokeballs and blown out backgrounds and I get that, but when it comes to actually controlling your shot to get the look that you want, this kind of thing matters. This became super limiting for me because I was then unable to get shots that I wanted to recreate or take, you know, inspiration from or just shots that I saw myself and wanted to get, including things like using old lenses that have swirly bokeh. You need a freaking metric ton of distance between your subject and your background with a crop sensor camera to really make that work. Whereas within like 10 feet of space on my full frame, I can get that swirly bokeh to come right back up. Again, there's some creative aspects to it, but in terms of the shot that I want to get, it was super limiting, and even if I had the money to throw at lenses, you eventually start hitting situations where lenses that you want don't exist. For example, that 12mm f2 on a full frame, if I wanted an equivalent look of that from a Micro Four Thirds camera, I'd need a 6mm f1 lens. And you start getting into ridiculous things where either they're prohibitively expensive because they are going to be thousands and thousands of dollars for these specialized super fast lenses, or they just don't exist, period. And that's really frustrating as someone who shoots only in small spaces and needs to work around this kind of thing. To explain the technical details of this, I'm going to invoke the power of Gerald Dundun, who does a much better job of explaining this stuff, and he has lots of videos on these subjects, which will be linked in the description below that I'm sure he'll talk about. But he's gonna do a better job of explaining this than I do. He has a full channel dedicated to super technical dives into camera topics like this. He's crazy. Hey, thanks for having me on, Adam. I totally understand the struggles you're facing. When it comes to crop factor, despite the math allowing for a somewhat limitless potential, there are definitely hard limits when it comes to what lenses exist and the shooting situations you can configure. If you aren't trying to draw equivalencies, it's easy to say that you can produce whatever you want on whatever system you want, but it does start to fall apart when you try to match certain full frame configurations on a smaller system like Micro Four Thirds. To show what I mean, let's convert this shot here. So on full frame, this shot would be accomplished by using a 35 millimeter lens set to f2.8 and at ISO 800. And this is pretty doable. 35 millimeter lenses are quite common on a full frame and so are f2.8 lenses of that focal length. But let's say that we wanted to create this look on Micro Four Thirds. Well, we'd have to apply the crop factor, which is essentially just a ratio that we'd have to apply to each of those aforementioned elements in order to match the look of full frame. This multiplier is based on the difference in size between the sensor in question, which which in this case is Micro Four Thirds, and a 35 millimeter film frame, which in this case is two times. The full frame sensor is two times wider than the Micro Four Thirds sensor. So to apply the crop factor, here's what you do. You take the focal length of your lens, which as we said is 35 millimeters, and you multiply it by your crop factor, which we said is two times, and so you're left with 70 millimeters. What this means is that a Micro Four Thirds camera with a 35 millimeter lens on will have a similar angle of view to a full frame camera with a 70 millimeter lens on. So in order to match that full frame look on Micro Four Thirds, we're gonna have to use a lens with half the focal length, so when the crop factor of two times is applied, it'll have the same field of view. So in this case, we're gonna need a 17.5 millimeter lens so that when we multiply it by two, we'll have our 35 millimeter equivalent. Next, we have to apply our crop factor in the same way to our f-stop, but not because of exposure, but because of depth of field. Putting that 17.5 millimeter f2.8 lens on a Micro Four Thirds system will give you a similar depth of field to a 35 millimeter f5.6 lens on full frame. It'll still have the same perceived brightness as an f2.8 lens, but your field will have a much deeper focus because of the way that f-numbers work. I made a whole video on on this topic if you're interested in learning more, but the gist of it is the reason why f-stops have that slash in them is because it's actually a formula for focal length divided by f-number equals diameter of the entrance pupil. The larger the entrance pupil, the shallower the depth of field. And so in our case, a 17.5 millimeter lens at f2.8 will have an entrance pupil diameter of 6.25 millimeters, which is the same as a 35 millimeter lens at f5.6. 35 divided by 5.6 is 6.25. So if you also wanted to match the depth of field of that full frame configuration, you'd also have to divide your f-stop by two. So our 35 millimeter f2.8 will now have to become a 17.5 millimeter f1.4 to get the same look that we have on the full frame. But moving to f1.4 will also make our image two stops too bright. So we'll also have to bring our ISO down two stops from ISO 800 down to ISO 200. Yet despite having this lower ISO, our noise levels will still be the same because crop factor is also applied to ISO 
but after you square it. And so if you want to know what ISO on full frame will have the same noise levels as an ISO on micro four thirds, you have to take that ISO on micro four thirds and multiply it by your crop factor squared, which in this case is two times, so two times squared would be four times. And so an ISO of 400 on micro four thirds would have similar noise levels to an ISO of 1600 on a full frame camera. And this is because full frame sensors gather more light and thus need less amplification, and so they produce less noise than a smaller sensor. And so in our example, ISO 200 on micro four thirds is equal to the noise levels of ISO 800 on a full frame camera. And now our equivalency is complete. And in this example, it all works out fine because this configuration is possible to achieve on micro four thirds. You can buy a 17 millimeter f1.4 lens for micro four thirds, but if you go any lower with that full frame configuration, you'll quickly run into problems finding a micro four thirds equivalency. Problems like the ones you've been running into, Adam. Now these equivalencies are a bit more friendly to another common crop, which is the APS-C or Super 35 at a rate of 1.5 times instead of two, except for Canon's APS-C, which has a crop factor of 1.6 times. You would apply it in the same way though. You would divide or multiply in this case by 1.5 times for the focal length and f-stop, and then you would apply the 1.5 times squared to the ISO or 2.25 times. And doing so to our example would get you an equivalency of roughly 24 millimeters at f1.8 and ISO 320. That's what you would need to achieve this shot on APS-C. This crop factor is easier to accommodate when pushed to extremes and remains possible in terms of lens availability and composition long after finding an equivalency on micro four thirds has failed. So typically this leads people to two conclusions. As I mentioned, just buy wider lenses, which you either run into lenses that don't exist or it's just limiting creatively. For example, like I mentioned on my G7, I've done most of my shooting A roll and B roll with that 12 millimeter lens, but that limits the kinds of shots I can do. I can only go so wide. I can only get so close. I can't really do macros with it. There's a lot of complications that's involved in that. And while I can have, you know, cheaper niche lenses to accomplish things like macro or I can just step back to get super wide in terms of tighter shot variety. I can only use so many certain lenses and that's really frustrating as someone who wants to be creative and do some really cool stuff in his videos. When you factor in the minimum focusing distance of some lens, especially higher end lenses and the flange distance and adapters and how that affects your light and things like that, these aren't necessarily multiplied by your sensor crop or anything like that, but they do really start to limit what, what kinds of shots you can get. And when you consider the fact that increases in lens size are still exponential based on your sensor size. So for example, going from that 12 millimeter prime that I mentioned to a 14 millimeter zoom, that's not a difference of two millimeters, that's a difference of four millimeters because I'm going from 22 or 24 millimeter equivalent to 28 millimeter equivalent. It's start, you know, every, every millimeter is multiplied by two. So you start to have more significant jumps per, between lenses or between zoom ranges as well. I mentioned before that shot from Eric Naso where if I want a nice blown out background, I either need a super wide, super fast lens, or I need a whole lot of distance. And that very much limits the shot I can get. And I don't just want wide and macro shots. I talked about before in a video where I got a Rokinon Prime set for my Panasonic G7. It was a about a $1,000 to $1,300 lens kit that I was super stoked for. It was very expensive but I ended up literally being unable to use it because all of the lenses had a minimum focusing distance of multiple feet. And when you factor in the fact that it, there is a two times crop factor, I can't even use them since they are super cropped in lenses as like macro lenses or something because I had to keep the camera so far back. So something like the 85 millimeter T1.5, a beautiful lens on my super 35 camera and on my full frame camera, I literally could not fit a shot within the room that I am shooting in and actually have anything in focus and framed decently well. And then same thing with a 35 millimeter. 35 millimeters typically considered one of the views of the human eye and is a nice comfortable range, but you add in the fact that you add in the crop factor, making it a six or a 70 millimeter, which makes it a much further along lens and the minimum focusing distance, meaning I can't even use it for cool up close shots. I'm no longer able to get decent shots. The 35 millimeter equivalent shot that I want to get, I just can't focus on. And instead I ended up using this really cool Nikon Nikkor film lens, which is 35 millimeter F2. It's apparently widely renowned for its beautiful, you know, smooth bokeh and things like that. It came on one of the Nikon F4-ish cameras. Uh, I have it on a Roxen speed booster to adapt it to my G7, which helps, you know, get more of that range, it has pretty much an up close to the lens focusing distance so I can actually get the shots that I want. So I ended up using this 
you know, vintage analog lens, which is still plenty sharp for my uses, that I basically got for free from a colleague over this $500 lens that was supposed to be better in every possible way. And that was just infuriating. Now, at the time when I bought that Rokin on Cine lens set, the smart decision and what a couple people told me to do would have been to purchase the Canon EF mount version of those lenses, which I ended up having to sell them off and rebuying anyway, and then buy the uh, Metabones speed booster for them. However, that would have added $600 to the cost, which I did not have at the time, and it was my impression that I was sticking with the Micro Four Thirds ecosystem. So I thought this was the way to go. I was less knowledgeable and experienced at the time and I wound up regretting it. Now, I can't just say that you need to find a way to budget for that speed booster because it's really expensive, but there is some blame on me for the actual purchase decision, of course. Now, let's talk about stream setups for a minute. If you're using a real camera for your live streams, it's actually really hard to get a blown out, you know, blurry background in your live streams. Webcams have super tiny sensors, and their actual focusing range is from right up on top of the lens to about two feet back. And then once you hit two feet back, that's considered infinity. And so literally everything is in focus. You can't really get shallow depth of field at any usable range with those webcams. And so you start to upgrade to real cameras. And again, with my Micro Four Thirds cameras, my current streaming setup is a Panasonic G7 and a Zcam E1, both Micro Four Thirds cam. And you, I can't really get significant blown out background without having literally my entire living room for my main shot. And then for my game streaming setup, I have a fisheye lens on it, which kind of helps a little bit, but I don't really get any background separation. I can't blur out my desk setup so much. So it looks cool, but it's still a little distracting because it's all in focus. And I have, as mentioned, legit been considering trying to figure out a way to get full frame cameras to make this work. Now, this is a little bit alleviated if you get an APS-C camera like the A5100, which is a freaking fantastic stream camera and the included 16 millimeter to whatever it is, 50 millimeter F3.5 to 5.6 lens, if you keep it wide open, is really nice for this but I'd like an even wider aperture lens for it at some point. They're just really expensive. It is great for that, and it works out really wonderfully. But even in my specific setup, I'm only getting slightly more blurred out background with that specific f-stop. So I need either a faster lens or to go full frame. And I'm legit considering it just because that is the look that I want to achieve. And you look at something like the Sub 2R camera, which is gaining a lot of popularity in terms of talking about it. It's not actually out yet. Uh, but because they're making, you know, the dream webcam, it's going to be $800, but it is a fully modular and complex camera that can be used as a USB webcam at 4K and 1080p60 and things like that. But it is a like 1.3 inch sensor or something like that. And so I even talked to people who have actually used it. And in order to get, you know, shots with it, the up close shots are like a F5 or not an F5, a five millimeter lens or a six millimeter lens or something like that, and you don't get much blurry background because that's pretty ridiculous at that point, or either they get like a six to 7.5 millimeter lens with a wide aperture and stick it six feet away, which is a little ridiculous once you start getting into the logistics of how do you get the camera that far away? Another thing to consider is that these super wide and super fast lenses that are great to throw on crop sensors are also usually manual focus, like that 12 millimeter I talked about. In order to get autofocus, you know, quality autofocus or digital controls of those lenses, which are required for a lot of shooting scenarios, you either have to pay a absurd amount of money to get them because they're very expensive or they just don't exist. Now, another approach that some people take are speed boosters or focal reducers. I mentioned those before. And they're a different approach to this problem depending on circumstances, but they're certainly not perfect and they can be quite expensive. And we're gonna go back to Gerald and Dunn to talk about this because this can get really complicated. So speed booster math is similar to what we did earlier, but it has an extra step involved, which is based on the ratio of focal reduction. If you imagine a lens as something that produces a circular projection of an image into your camera, well, the speed booster is just a way to resize that circle. When you put a full frame lens onto a smaller body, the circle's too big and a lot of it goes unused and only the center section is actually captured by the sensor and the rest of it is just seemingly cropped away, which is where we get the idea of crop factor. What a speed booster does is shrink that circle down to fit the smaller sensor better and weigh 
waste less of that projection. This allows for a wider field of view and a faster exposure. Each speed booster will have its own multiplier that you'll need to apply to the lens that it's adapting. So let's go back to our earlier example of the 35mm f2.8 lens being adapted for micro four thirds. Well, if you used a 0.7 times speed booster, that lens would now be changed into a 24mm f2 lens because 35mm times 0.7 is about 24mm and the 2.8 times 0.7 is about f2. Then when you put this on your micro four thirds system, you'll have a 48mm f4 lens because we still need to apply that two times crop factor for micro four thirds. But keep in mind, it's gonna be an f4 in terms of depth of field, but still an f2 in terms of exposure, which is still significantly better than the direct two times conversion giving you a 70mm f5.6 lens. So that's it for the math, but there are other considerations to make. Generally, when using a speed booster, you can expect to see worse autofocus performance, and some of the advanced features of your lens may be disabled. And there's also pricing and size considerations to make when making large lenses even larger, and I'm sure these are some of the struggles that you faced, Adam. So speed boosters can be great and work in a lot of situations. However, they're, they're not perfect. They can be super expensive. The good ones, the good ones for Metabones are $600 per speed booster, which can get ridiculous. And I mean, I can't justify that right now. Some of the super cheap ones, like the Roxen ones I mentioned, are like 90 bucks, depending on, you know, what mount you have, but they're completely manual focus. You lose all, you know, digital controls over your lenses. And then there's the Viltrox ones, which are 150 to $210, depending on which ones you get. I just ordered one for my Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K review. Those are all right but they still, with half the cameras, you don't get the actual digital controls, they can't communicate properly, and you start to run into quality differences because speed boosters are another piece of glass between your lens and your sensor, which means that you can end up with reduced sharpness, especially around the ed edges. This is a serious problem with the Viltrox speed boosters. You can get chromatic aberrations and just other weird distortions. And the other thing comes into light sensitivity of your sensor. The smaller your sensor, the less sensitive or, you know, the less it performs in low light scenarios, which is most of us bedroom studio shooting people. And so that's something I really ran into. And obviously that scales with age and value of the camera. Like my T3i, which was APS-C, was much worse with light performance than my Panasonic G7 and G87 or G85s or whatever, which are a smaller sensor, but newer and updated and perform better in low light. But a full frame camera is always going to be, you know, reasonably speaking, better at light performance and light reproduction than a crop sensor camera. So as much as you can, you know, bring in some of the original light from a full frame lens onto a crop sensor camera with a speed booster, it doesn't increase the amount of light that the lens was already bringing in. And the way that the sensor performs with that light is still going to be superior with the direct full frame utilization in the first place. Now that light translation, you can actually have a lot of fun with. I have this big, huge, six by seven medium format film lens, which has an F4 aperture on its native mounting system, but I have it with a pseudo speed booster mount thing to my full frame uh, Canon 60 Mark II, and I've used it in some shots on my Ursa Mini Pro here, and you still get some nice, beautiful blown out depth of field, but you have a lot of fun having that much bigger source of light on bigger sensors, which has been really fun to mess around with. Now, full frame cameras aren't perfect either. Unless you're getting cine focused full frames like the Kinefinity Mavo LF or the Red Monstro full frame, both of which are like dream cameras to me at the moment because they are full, full frame. They record the entire sensor. You can do a lot of stuff with it and you can go to even higher frame rates by cropping in. When you have a full frame DSLR or mirrorless, especially from Canon and a lot of the Sonys are running into limitations as well, you start to run into limitations of what is actually done. You're not getting the full sensors readout into your video. They do line skipping or pixel binning or things like that, all of which Gerald has videos on explaining. If you're curious, I'll link them below but they, you don't get the full sensor readout or either you run into other issues like this still doesn't have 4K despite releasing during the 4K time of cameras. Sony's overheat or have limits. There are a lot of sacrifices that you make with the more DSLR form factor full frames. And so they're not perfect themselves, which is why they're not for everyone. And if we're speaking about my Canon 60 Mark II here, it has both line skipping and some sort of weird pixel binning moire filter which results in smooth curve things looking super pixelated and jaggedy which has ticked me off to no end choosing a camera to purchase especially when you're on a limited budget is a delicate process that you need to have the right guidance for and if you're in these kinds of shooting spaces and making content like this 
you need to actually consider these kinds of things and constantly being yelled at in these kinds of videos to say gear doesn't matter you can make anything with anything is literally unhelpful it's super inspirational for the people who don't have a whole lot and need to be like encouraged to keep making even though they can't afford great gear that's fine and i respect that but when you are someone looking to make gear purchasing decisions or figure out what your workflow should be that is the most counterproductive kind of messaging and language that you can give and it drives me to no end so so as i mentioned seeing youtubers who have a table full of cameras and lenses being like yeah you can mix this with this and this with this and this with this because you already have it all right is totally fine just drives me up a wall and while yes, you can create any of those things with any of those cameras and mostly find a way to work around it, that doesn't mean that you don't run into some serious frustrations or limitations that you might have been able to avoid making slightly different decisions. Full frame tends to be a little bit more expensive and inaccessible compared to their crop sensor counterparts, but if that means avoiding micro four thirds because these are the kind of situations you're shooting in or using micro four thirds because you're in more long distance shooting scenarios where that crop factor is more of a boon than a problem, those are things you need to know. Picking up my Panasonic G7 in November 2016 radically changed my entire production skill set and the shots I was able to get and my entire workflow with regards to video production. My T3i was a piece of crap by the time I was done using it in terms of video production for my needs, and the G7 radically changed that, even though it was a smaller sensor. But af after the two years of me using it before I purchased a real cinema camera with a bigger sensor, by that point, I had run into a lot of limitations purely based on the sensor size alone, which is one of the big reasons I wanted to get a bigger sensor camera. And this Ursa Mini Pro has allowed me a lot more flexibility and a lot more control over the shots that I get, somewhat only based on the crop sensor, or on the sensor crop, the sensor size as is. Now, it is a Super 35 sensor, which is great and bigger, like I said, but there are situations where I would prefer to use my full-frame Canon 60 Mark II if the video in it wasn't so meh, or my Panasonic G7 with a wide-angle lens. But I have invested in another solution for this camera. Instead of buying a separate full-frame video camera, there is a company called, or a person called Luke Adapters that has been making pseudo speed boosters or what they call magic boosters for the Ursa line. They've previously only had them for the Ursa Mini and Ursa Mini 4.6K and things like that, which were just basically little lenses you drop into the lens mount thing and kind of seal it in there, which was apparently a really scary process according to this review, which was pretty cool. But for the Ursa Mini Pro, they actually crowdfunded a dedicated lens mount, which uses the original Blackmagic lens mount, but integrates a speed booster or magic booster lens system in it to basically bring the full frame field of view to the Ursa Mini Pro's Super 35 sensor. And this is phenomenal. I don't have it yet. I had to purchase it. It was incredibly expensive, but it was still cheaper than buying another full frame camera or something like that and seemed like the right decision but I am going to make a dedicated video on it, but it seems really freaking cool. Because again, it's a dedicated lens mount. The Ursa Mini Pro has interchangeable lens mounts. So that means that I can go back and forth between them as needed, but since most of my glass is full frame, that means I'm just, as, it's, as the magic booster name implies, like magic, getting more field of view out of this camera, which means this current shot where I cannot reach the camera, I can bring it, I can scorpion get over here bring it closer and I can get more blurred out backgrounds. I can get, you know, better light production out of my lenses. Since this is already a beautiful sensor, I can get a lot out of it. This also has a benefit for the crop shooting mode. In order to shoot 120 FPS on this camera, which it can do in 1080p, I have to go into crop mode, which further crops in and changes where this camera has to be and things like that. And with this booster, the crop mode will be equivalent to the super 35 mode that I'm already shooting in for the most part, if not wider which means, or if not, you know, it may be different. I don't know the exact crop factor, but you know, it will bring it back out, which means when I'm doing crop shooting or slow-mo shooting, I'll have even more room. This is going to be phenomenal and I'm super stoked. Just wanted to mention that. The problem though, moving to full frame is that there are still a lot of lenses that are crop sensor. Any EFS lenses are APS-C size instead of full frame. Now I don't have too many of those, although I'll have to be careful looking into all of my different vintage lens conversions, which are designed to be converted for crop sensor cameras anyway, but all of my native EF lenses are mostly fine. However, the lens that I shoot on the most for my A-roll at this point that I'm shooting this on, which is the 
world-renowned Sigma 18-35 f1.8 art lens, it's only APS-C size. Which means if I put it on my Canon 60 Mark II, I have to zoom in pretty much all the way to 35mm in order to not get massive vignetting, and means that with this magic booster, without going into crop mode, I'll be unable to use it. And crop mode would defeat the point. But all of my other lenses are suddenly a lot more usable, and I can easily replace this with something more usable in that scenario. But that is something worth noting. And if you yourself are a photographer or videographer and want to show off your work regardless of all of these crop sensor issues, then you should check out Squarespace. Squarespace empowers millions of dreamers, makers, and doers by providing them with the tools they need to bring their creative ideas to life. On Squarespace's dynamic all-in-one platforms, customers can claim a domain, build a website, sell online, and market a brand. Their suite of products combines cutting-edge design and world-class engineering to make it easier than ever to establish and own your online presence. Check them out today at squarespace.com to sign up for a free trial, and when you're ready to actually launch your website, you can go to squarespace.com slash epostvox to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So that's the end of my notes. I know this has been a very long video, but I really wanted to get my two cents in as someone who has a slightly different perspective than general photography or I have all the cameras or I'm shooting outdoors, people shooting indoors in small spaces. I wanted to get this perspective in and cover a lot of information. So feel free to rewatch this video, go back and forth in different sections, whatever. I just wanted all this information in one place. And thank you so much to Gerald Undon for contributing and doing the tech side of this or the technical side of this. Uh, like I said, he has a really good channel full of lots of deep dive rabbit holes of super technical aspects of cameras and photography and videography that very few people cover. And you should definitely check him out no matter what your interest in cameras are. I'm Abel's Vox here to make tech easier and more fun. This may not be super easy, but, or maybe even fun, but it's stuff that you need to know. Hit the like button if you enjoyed. Subscribe for more tech education. I'll have a link to that Luke Adapter stuff if you happen to be an Ursa Mini Pro owner in the description down below. However, it's not really purchasable for non-crowdfunders at the moment. I, I don't know if they'll be selling them in mass in the future, but they do have the normal Ursa Mini options available. And subscribe and all of that jazz. Come check us out on Patreon and yada yada to help fund my camera addictions. And I'll see you next time.